And we are now recording the first and pilot of the coaches on the couch. Uh, basically, the premise of the show is a bunch of you all fans and everybody have asked to meet us coaches. And we have tracked down and made a discord with a bunch of us in it. And periodically, we're going to get a bunch of us to come and visit the show. There will be a bunch of familiar faces that will be here consistently, like the friends who are joining me on this first one. Hopefully, you guys like it. We're going to look for a lot of feedback so we can refine it and make it exactly what you guys want. Uh, basically with the show, we're going to start off at the basics of the game, the basics of coaching, the basics of what you need to do, and then we'll get into the advanced stuff. So we'll cover everything from bronze players all the way up to grandmasters. And uh, once we get all that done, we will cover all the topics. Uh, everybody will have a bunch of fun stuff and whatnot, and we can have a bunch of conversation topics. So... We will go from there. Uh, we're going to start with intros. Uh, I will be greedy and go first. I am the five-hour energy Detroit Renegades head coach, Gurgeon, also the team's analyst. Uh, I have the privilege of having a manager. Some of these gentlemen don't. Um, so that is me, and we're going to go to the top, and we have a good friend of mine who is at the top. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, I'm CLG Cuddles, the coach for CounterLogic Gaming. Uh, I'm also a yeah, head coach, analyst. I'm manager too. I'm everything uh, and, and anything these guys need here at CLG. Um, and hopefully in the future, I'll be getting myself a handy analyst on the side. But just for now, it's just me powering the boat along. Hey there, I'm Dignitas Shifty. Obviously, I coach Team Dignitas. Um, I'm also a one-man show when it comes to uh, coaching, team manager, and analyst. Um, Pretty much do everything that the team does, just like uh, Cuddle talks about. If they uh, setting up scrims to one-on-one -on -one coaching, to helping with strategies and uh, analyzing games, feedback, setting everything up, um, try to take everything off the player's plate as possible and try to make it as streamlined and uh, easy for them so they can just focus on fragging and making sure to making awesome plays and uh, figuring out what went wrong. I'm uh, Liquid <laughs> Um Well, I do pretty much the same thing as these guys, piggybacking all the way. Um, but I do the coaching and the anal uh, analyst position right now. I do some of the managerial work. I do have the privilege of having a manager as well that takes care of more of the like the tournament side, talking with admins and making sure we're all prepped for that and signed up. But I do do um, a lot of that as well with uh, usually weekly schedules and making sure that everyone's here uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing and practicing well. And I believe we have one more, but his Discord is a little robotic right now. Let's see if he's got it fixed. Do you, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself now that you're back? Uh, yeah, so I am LG Evil Precision. I do managerial and coaching work for uh, the LG Evil team. I uh, previously did some work with LG Loyal as well, uh, minimal coaching, uh, but I focus full-time now on LG Evil. Um, yeah, that's about it. All right. So these are the five people we have currently for today. And every time we get somebody new, we'll be glad to let them introduce themselves. Uh, you'll get a lot to know names that are unknown currently in the scene. We are the, the ninjas behind the pro teams. You might know about all of our fancy pro players and our fraggers and our tanks that clean with the finest shields. But, you know, in general, we are the guys who work behind the scenes and are there helping, you know, the players you guys love behind the scenes. So first topic and this is just in general um and it's something like that just segues for all of us from where we just went with introductions is basically what is coaching and a lot of people and a lot of fans ask me what is coaching what do you actually do like it's not as simple as an nfl coach where i am literally just looking at a playbook or you know it's not as simple as being a personal coach where i'm just trying to get you to achieve the best you can do um for me personally uh, coaching is a mixture of everything. It's I want to get six people to work together as a unit while also getting the best out of them, while also trying to figure out what makes each of them tick and makes it so that they can function to their utmost peak and be most consistent. What about anyone else? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm pretty much on the same lines. I'm constantly helping these guys along their way and trying to set them up for success, basically. I live by 
and work by those rules of just making sure the players are always ready and raring to go every day up to a good schedule and routine wanting to work together and making sure the team is glued together and just making a working machine go, I guess. And then on the side, making sure I have all those strats that I can feed into them, working together with them and getting those Ws. Um, let me just kind of explain a little bit of the difference between uh, what other people may be considered traditional sports coaching and uh, what coaching is like for an eSports or at least for Overwatch, the difference between the two. Because I'm sure that most people don't understand or aren't familiar with what's going on in eSports coaching, but may have a little bit better idea with traditional sports. Like you said, it's not like we have a playbook. This is a lot of untapped territory for the most part. And it's also, you have to understand that rules change all the time. Meta changes all the time. If if, if to give you an equivalent, it's like, all right, you're a football coach, but right now you, have two, you can have two quarterbacks or you can have two balls or blizzard changes so that you now wide receivers can't do this as well as they used to. And you have to make an adjustment based on your strategy. Okay, does this change our playbook? Does this change how we're gonna do things? Does this change our strategy? Can we take advantage of this somehow? How does it affect other teams? All those little things can change everything when it comes to do. And a strategy you had that used to be dominant may be obsolete now, you have to adjust. So um, that's one thing that we have to deal with. We have to figure out as quickly as possible, and hopefully before other teams, <laughs> or um, uh, you know, figure out how can we make this work with our players. And like everyone, like everyone else said, yes, we try to make the best thing with our players. Everyone is a different um, uh, group of people that they are working with. And because of that, some compositions are better than other compositions and some things are better with our mentality. You see some teams have their own identity and they stick with it. Other teams try to adjust and be more flexible. And it's not necessarily one is always superior than the other. You got to figure out what works for you, and that's kind of what coaching is all about. Agreed, but I think for us, uh, especially the difference between uh, traditional sports and esports as well. Um, not to say that traditional sports doesn't have this. I think it's, we it, in the esports side focus it. We should, and I, I know uh, I do. I can't speak for every other coach, but we have to kind of focus more on the mentality side as well, um, because we are a lot of these players. You know, they are a lot younger, um, for one. They haven't really been into the outside world as much, um, usually are exposed to a lot of the media, a lot of the the fans, a lot of the, uh, you know, everything that kind of entails of being a pro player and just making sure that their mental health is very stable as well, making sure that they, you know, are thinking in the right way, making sure that they aren't getting, you know, just crush on reddit or something that has it and just making sure that you're keeping on top of that um that's a big thing as well especially with uh player coaches with younger players um i know some of these other uh some of the other coaches have a lot of younger players on their team and making sure that they are growing up as well as a person and not just in game kind of both of those coincide and kind of lift each other up do you want to add anything precision uh yeah i mean uh, I, I do coach one of like the youngest teams in the scene right now. I think with uh, everyone being basically twenty or younger, um, except for Vast. So um, I can definitely agree with what Laura says. It, it's it's also a mentality thing, especially with my team, um, considering they're probably one of the youngest teams uh, in the scene. Um, is trying to make sure they adapt to this growing kind of uh, spotlight that, that they're being tossed into. Um, as well as keeping their mentality on the game and focusing on changes and things that are coming in. Um, and I think part of it is also like teaching them uh, how to maintain that mentality and to not get focused on some of these sidetrack things that can derail your career. Um, if you look at like what happened in Korea with a couple of players, like that kind of situation, uh, trying to keep them out of that. Yeah. So I, Without getting too deep into it for context or anybody that doesn't know uh yeah you, you need life experience to deal with real life things not just be good at a video game so yeah i also uh want to take a moment and I, I find it funny and i'm gonna throw you under the bus a little bit that the liquid coach who has one of the older teams the more mature teams in the scene brought that topic up it's great it's great. Uh, well, <laughs> it, well, here's here's the thing too. But I mean, we, you uh, for people that you guys uh, that don't know, um, Liquid has had probably one of the oldest rosters in the scene. 
Um, they're all great guys. They all have played professionally in Quake, um, and they know their they know their stuff. But we recently just picked up Shatter 2K, which if everyone knows, he's like 17 years old. The young groom, so ha- overlord. Exactly. I mean, he's he's an, he's a machine. But you think about the kind of the contrast, you know, of having some of these older guys that do have real life experience, have been around the scene, have you know, have a little bit more knowledge and wisdom under their belt. And all of a sudden, we have a 17-year-old that's like he's like a prodigy, pretty much. Yeah. You know, kind of having that because I I feel like I have to mentor him a bit more than I have to say like Rafa or Dehang or someone. And, um, those are two of the players on Team Liquid. For people um don't quite know, um, I have to mentor him a bit more and kind of oversee and kind of talk to him a bit more because I don't want him to get into that mindset of you know, I'm the best, or, I mean, he is, but, like, you know, just getting overly cocky and not being mature, because he does get that way sometimes, and that, that's just fair, you know, he's a bit younger, but just making sure that you do call him out on it, and being, you know, being very straightforward with him and being honest, be like, yeah, this isn't gonna fly kind of thing, you know, if he does kind of make that mistake. But, it is interesting, I mean, Cuddles, like, you have a pretty young team as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think... I think with me being here at CLG, CLG have like some really the staff here is great, and we have a lot of social media managers and stuff as well. So they help me along that side of things. I think where you get yeah, the same as where you guys come from, you kind of just have to help the guys along the side of making the right decisions again on social media, life decisions, and just again the overconfidence thing. Like I have people at hydration that he knows he's good, he's a great player, but you have to make sure he turns it down and he doesn't get too overly confident because he's going to bite him in the ass at some point you know he might go on social media and start bigging himself up and they think you know he throws a game and he's going to get a lot of shit so yeah i agree with the way yeah what you guys do and i do the same i have a lot of help though here at clg when it comes to that type of stuff i don't have to rely on it i have to don't have to do it myself as much but i always try and make sure it's weaned into my sessions somehow just to make sure the guys behave themselves that's, a, that's actually a good thing we can talk about uh, while we're still on the topic. For me personally, um, I have another person who helps me, and then my org helps, of course. Most organizations, once you're signed, help you with your social media, developing your following, all this other stuff. But when it comes to the actual in-game stuff, um, I don't know how many of you teams actually have them or if you have access to them. But I, when I was working with Immortals, I had the privilege of working with them. Uh, a sports psychologist, uh, do any of you all have them and do they help you with your team at all? Yeah, we have like player development coaches starting here for the other teams and they just help me alongside with mine. Hopefully I should also be getting one from in the future because that's something that I actually do on the side. I kind of help with the sports psychology stuff. Anybody else? Or are we all just alone on that subject? Um, I mean, I, I, be- I think, I believe, I haven't had a chance to talk to a lot of the other teams, managers, coaches, um, because I'm still relatively new to the org. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that our CSGO team has one, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. I haven't had a chance to talk to you, uh, Joka, about it. Um, but I, I kind of play a little bit a, a part of that just because of, what I graduated in college with it, so I kind of assume that role. I'm not official or anything, but I feel like that's. Yeah, I just kind of assume it and just use what I learned to try to um, work with the team that way. And then, like you said, like kind of whatever sessions I can get in, I, I will try to do. Like I'm doing one here actually pretty soon on our day off and talking to everyone one on one, kind of get a feel and how everything's going and seeing if I can pinpoint a reason why something isn't happening or some things are happening, a good or bad, either way. I, uh, I I sort of did that backwards, by the way. Uh, for anybody who's listening out there that doesn't know, sports psychologists are the guys who focus purely on the mental state and how your body works with the game. So whereas I am the in-game, you know, quote-unquote genius when it comes to the master plans and stuff, they're the guy who says, you know, your wrist is going to get hurt if you keep playing this way. They're the guy who says, you know, if you worked on your diet, this is what could help you. Um, I'm going to do a hashtag sellout moment. Uh, IMT Robert Yip. I had a privilege of working with him when I had a short tenure at IMT. He is one of the best I've met and seen. Um, he goes through everything between how to resolve a situation to how does something the way it's said affect someone to daily diet to exercise to all that stuff and it's an immense resource if you have it um a lot of orgs they don't but it's perfectly fine like and we fill those shoes from time to time like um i don't know if anybody else here has had to deal with a player injury 
but player injuries are something that's going to creep up in our line of work. And I am no, by no means a doctor, but I can definitely tell when something is physically wrong with you and I will take you to said place. But having a sports psychologist who is an expert or dabbles in the field of medicine definitely does help when pushing these players to get the the 99 percent out of them and make them the most efficient esports gods they can be anybody else want to add anything um well i guess it doesn't have to do with liquid but i did get a chance to work with one when i was back on colorado clutch uh for you guys that don't know it was a team based here where i live in colorado um we were actually a top 10 team back then but it was uh, things happened, and unfortunately, the org disbanded. And same same with the team. Some of the players went to different orgs. I know some of the players went to uh, went to GFE. Calvin, I'm sure some of you guys might have seen him stream on Twitch. Uh, he's a really popular streamer. He was on that. He was on that lineup. And having someone there, like you said, Kurgan, uh, just to kind of say and tell the players, like, hey, you talking about this or addressing it in this way just like straight problem solving or just conflict resolution was really nice to have because me and the uh, the coach at the time we were having troubles kind of getting through to everyone um just because like i was new and uh the coach was there but he didn't really have a voice too much and so that having him was really helpful in kind of figuring out what the problems were and how to address them that's for damn sure so um yeah if you have access at all to even just maybe even someone studying and to get some ideas or some of the professionals that do are out there um use them they are a great resource that's for sure well uh we we had that conversation a new challenger arose if the new challenger wants to introduce himself for everyone because we are already recording uh he is more than welcome to we would like to know i don't know if it's official if you could say it but if not, you could say what team you formerly coached for and who you is and what do you do for your org. And then the topic we are on is what is coaching to you? Sure. So uh, who I is is uh, my name is Seamus Seamus Anderson. Hey, I'm answering your question. Uh, I formerly coached Tempo Storm as well as Method and then one shot uh, as an amateur or on an amateur org. Um and I am soon to be the coach for Energy Esports. Uh, and, and coaching to me, um, there's a lot of different things that I would say go into coaching right now for Overwatch coaches. I'm sure you all would agree. But uh, some of the things I balance and juggle with is not only talking about the game and playing the best compositions and, and developing strategies and communication systems for the players to use to, to best approach Overwatch in general, but also keeping mentality good, uh, sort of helping the players stay humble, lose the ego, kind of talk to each other more and develop as players, not only individually, but also come together and be a really effective team. Um, so what, I, what I've been doing lately is uh, trying to push myself to study uh, not only the game itself by watching bots and stuff, but I also have been reading a lot of books on like sports psychology and aspects of teamwork and aspects of sort of inner motivation and focus that I can try and help the players with. See, somebody who wasn't even on the topic made the jump to sports psychology. It must be something important for the people who are listening. <laughs> I would certainly say so. Um, fundamentally, I think that pretty much sums up basic coaching at the moment like there's finite little tweaks and details each team and each coach has to deal with uh genuinely we each are coaching six different uh players but the, the way i like to put it and it's actually really funny uh is you're a coach for six players but it's trying to buy six wives six different forms of soap because each player wants to be coached a different way and you have to find you know that favorite scent that they love that is how they get the most out of the learning and the experience and then you have the other one who doesn't like that soap. And soap is never just soap to a woman. You have six wives. I'm impressed. Hey, <laughs> that's okay. just... we, we, won't, we won't question that for right now. It was an analogy. Um, for anybody who's curious, no, I am not married to anyone. <laughs> but, so what you're saying is you're accepting invitations. Uh, potentially. We should... Hey, this is I'm throwing myself out there on this show. Let's 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 go ahead and go with it. <laughs> You're selling out everything. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, it's supposed to be fun, man. All right. <laughs> so moving, moving along, moving along, moving along. After I threw myself under the bus, um, we're gonna talk about some of the most basic, basic things in esports in general. And one of the most basic things we could talk about is your setup. And your setup is broken down basically into almost three to five things. It is your mouse, your keyboard, your monitor, your PC, your chair, and your posture, and how you actually play. So for me personally, uh, as I am not at my gaming house where I have, you know, 10 out of 10 in all of those categories, I currently have a PC that I would probably put at a 7 out of a 10. I have my mouse that is my personal preference, um, has an OK sensor in it. Uh, large mouse pad, not big millimeters. Uh, I have my 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 keyboard, the mechanical, just feels comfortable to me. I have 144 hertz monitor as my main monitor, and then I have a secondary monitor just for external extra things. Um, my chair is subpar, and my posture is crap because of my subpar chair. <laughs> and these things actually affect you in game. You think that they don't, and you think that this is just how I play the game, but when you look at it looking at how you play the game uh how you rest your arm can affect if you'll hurt yourself or if you're getting the most out of your movement uh one of the things is uh that's constantly debated in the community is dpi versus sense and wrist versus uh arm movement so we'll segue into that if anybody wants to jump in uh, yeah i'll take the hit um Basically, yeah, I can, I can agree with that. Um, a lot of things that come down to, in my opinion, if you can get guys top tier peripherals or like top of the line peripherals, you know, the good sensors and my, uh, mice nowadays, you know, uh, they're probably going to pick up anywhere from like what I'd say like 400 DPI up to like 16,000, right? Yeah, that's a good ballpark. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, most of those sensors can pick up several thousand DPI down to several hundred. Um, and the wrist to arm movement is basically, you know, uh, it's player preference, but I feel, in my honest opinion, like if it's too much of a wrist player that you can actually cause some ligament strain and tendon strain in your wrist, and it'll lead the carpal tunnel, you know, um, as well as typing and wrist posture and how you hold your mouse. Um, in terms of back posture and how you sit, that's another big thing. Um, we're lucky enough to have a chair sponsor, so we actually have really good chairs, you know. Um, and that was one of the things that I noticed personally when I got my chair because I was sitting in like a about a 15 year old chair that was really tiny. And for reference, I'm about six foot five, and really tiny chairs don't work with me. Uh, so uh, my posture was really, really bad uh, because I was basically hunched up in a tiny little seat. Uh, had a really good gaming chair, and my posture is now back to how it should be. You know, back against the back of the chair. You know, lumbar support, sitting up straight. Um, and it even makes a difference in, you know, how I feel during a gaming session. I can go those extended hours I need to. Um, and I don't feel like I'm losing as much energy during the entire time that I'm there. Um, and also, I, from a monitor perspective, um, you know, it's been proven 144 hertz is always going to be better than 60 hertz, you know. Um, it's, it's the refresh rates. It, it's that split second of... You know, you don't get that skip in your refresh while you're shooting at a far end this guy. Uh, they might give you that extra advantage over someone. Um, those are my just my personal opinions, you know. Um, if you guys have any input, go for it. I definitely think that a posture is a big thing because I think it helps also with your consistency. If your posture is bad, it's typically not consistent. And if, you're, if your posture isn't consistent, then you're going to make these fine-tuned adjustments with both your arm and wrist as well as the rest of your body that you may not necessarily be conscious of, but it's always going to be a factor. So having good posture is going to have better consistent posture. And then you're not always uh, quite as looking for different, making little minute changes like, oh, my aim is off today um, quite as often. And it's hard to get a lot of variables into it, but I definitely think posture is one of them. Um, as far as monitors go, we got some players with 240 hertz monitors. So um, uh, definitely something that we value very highly. Um, being able to see everything as, um, as clearly as possible and get the frame rates obviously up to 240 or higher, which isn't that big a deal in Overwatch um, on the rigs any of our players are running. But it is a big factor as well. If you're still running on uh, 60 hertz or anything below, uh, you know, 
100 hertz, it, you're going to be at disadvantage at the highest levels of this game. And that's definitely something to consider as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with the just the general setup as well the play, the players have. I know that some of there's some players that I've worked with and know and they will literally measure out their setup with a ruler before lands and before they they start training and slash scrimming every single day. You know, I've had players that he'll like measure the height of his uh, armrest, making sure it's the right distance, and measuring how far away it is from the desk, and then measuring whereabouts their keyboard and mouse might have set up and the distance that they are from the monitor, so they can be as consistent as they possibly can. Um, and like I say, if it works for some guys, it works for some people. And again, there's probably some science behind the fact that it does, again, make you a consistent player. And in games like Overwatch, again, the word consistency is extremely important. And it means that you will be performing at your peak as often as possible. Did anybody else want to weigh it? Besides just consistency, I think that the player health is a pretty co big concern when it comes to posture alone. Um, in terms of how you put your arm on the table or how you hold your arm, your wrist and stuff. Uh, I think most gamers have experienced, after playing a long time, on a chair without lumbar support, that sort of painful feeling in your lower back. Uh, if, if it's underdeveloped and sort of long-lasting physical pain as, as a young adult, which is kind of kind of scary. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that besides just being actual health concerns and potentially causing your players to have shorter careers are also uh, certainly barriers when you have pain in terms of playing because if you're focusing on pain in your wrist or pain in your back or, or just when how you're sitting down if, if there's pain there then uh <laughs> that makes it hard to focus on the game so besides just consistency i think the overall importance of health and setup is really really important which is why i would suggest anyone who doesn't have a gaming chair and does it for a while and does have posture to, to probably get one like i'm not even trying to sell out I just think that they're very effective at forcing you to have better and healthier posture. Yeah, definitely all of that stuff is your basic setup. Like, the, the number one thing I get asked sometimes by guys when I'm at an event or whatever is, what, what setup do you use? What, what mouse do you use? What keyboard do you use? Like, you're going to find that there's comfort factor, and you will find the guys in the pro scene who are, as was previously mentioned, they get the ruler out, and it's for consistency. It's for consistency's sake. So if we turn some of you into tinfoil hat guys who carry around 12-inch ruler everywhere, more power <laughs> to you. If not, figure out what's comfortable for you. The biggest things we can honestly say are, are make sure you keep this in mind. A lot of gamers, they don't think about their posture. They don't think about their wrist movement. They don't think about the 17 things that are stacked on their mouse pad that make them play like they're on a 3-inch mouse pad when they really have a 16 or a 20-inch one. Uh, the giant 3-foot ones, I've seen a guy who used those and literally he flings his arm across the entire thing. He uses like the surface area is like double 18-inch uh, mouse pad or a 20. And like, it's for consistency's sake. And he's, he's an arm player and the difference, for anybody who doesn't know, the difference between an arm player and a hand player is you primarily use your elbow and your shoulder as an arm player, whereas a, a wrist player, you primarily use your wrist and your elbow. So it is which joints do you put the most burden on is defines your, your quote-unquote aiming and play style with your mouse. So I think that is a good wrap-up for this. I think there's a bunch of stuff we'll revisit with this in the future. Um, stuff that gets brought up when new tech or anything comes out, because that's actually actually that's a good point. We'll, we'll cover that real quick. As a coach, how important is it to keep up to date with new technology? The new uh, what is it? The new Logitech sensors that came out not too long ago. Anyone? No oh, idea. Uh, uh, go for it, Seamus. All right, I was just gonna say. So I use a 2012 uh, Death Adder, and uh, no, excuse me. 2012 Abyssus and Black Widow Ultimate. Um, I'm not a pro player, but I have used these peripherals since college, and, and they've still been very successful for me. I think there's something that's that uh, peripherals that are coming out like in the modern day are, are better at, just in terms of actual performance. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to functionality, though. It doesn't have the basic decent functions, and then discomfort with a with a platform 
Do you like using it? Does it feel good? Because uh, that's great. Because even if you have a keyboard with 400 buttons, uh, in Overwatch, you're only going to use maybe 30 of those. So <laughs> that's all you need. And when it comes to mice... Let me stop you for a sec. What hero are you playing that you need 30 buttons? <laughs> I'm being okay, honest. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know, I'm Hold just saying, like, counting, like counting, a max, counting, max. Oh buttons. my god, you know what I mean? Like, you use 15 buttons, maybe, but like, you, you need some, uh, you need some letter keys to, to flame your teammates too. I, so I got 18, and that's including BM buttons. <laughs> I've never, I've never like actually tried to list it all. Then, well, if you think of it this way, if you, if you went and for every wheel, uh, you added a hotkey button, and then for each four options in the wheel. Like for each emote, each different taunt and stuff. I bet you could find at least thirty different buttons to use. Okay, all right, but... all right. We're, we're 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 pausing for a second. Blizzard needs to release a typing hero. Literally, if you type it, it plays perfectly for you, and it's like, like speed typing, typing of the dead type style. Yeah, That'd be interesting. The you just have like typing. a key racer just like yeah. going down your screen. That'll change the recruitment. <laughs> yeah, that, that would definitely make it different. Looking for secretary with 17 years experience, age no limit. But no, I just I've, I had to poke fun at you for a moment, Simo. So you, you can go ahead and continue. Oh, no, it, it's fine. Um, I just yeah, like I I don't see like. I could see some use for peripherals that allow you to switch DPI for certain heroes, uh, especially the less less aim focused, because you want to swap from you know hammer DPI to perhaps more of a, a, a flex player would go to like May DPI, where they want to aim a little bit more. But even then, that, that I just don't really see any reason in having like the the new Ultra Logitech Super Mega Razor Super Headphone keyboard mouse conundrum piece of equipment from 2020 because it's not really going to make you that much better of a player the peripheral is a peripheral as long as it's decent it's good it's just I'm... what works for you i guess isn't it just yeah. go through 100 mice and then just pick which one works for you obviously going through 100 mice is ridiculous but you know where i'm coming from <laughs> if you if you if that i don't know 15 dollar microsoft mouse works, works perfect for you and then you pull out the, the 200 dollar razor mouse and that one doesn't work as well then Go for the Microsoft one. I don't care. Just as long as it makes you perform well. I'm gonna agree 100 with that. Like it goes comfort over necessarily the best sensor in the world. Because at some point, the sensor is going to exceed your ability to manage exactly where you're gonna put your mouse. These pros are good, but the sensors are still gonna be more accurate than that for the vast majority of the time. Now, if you have a bad sensor and you know you've got like pixel skipping, yeah, that's an issue. But most mice nowadays don't have that issue. Um, at least the ones that they're using right now. And whether it fits your hand correctly, whether you feel comfortable it, with it in your grip, whether it glides, oh, I hope they'll probably all glide smoothly, but just it feels better for the player, that comfort level is going to allow them to be able to adjust and improve better than necessarily if they have the best sensor in the world. So yes, like everyone said, whether or not they're comfortable with it, whether it works for them, that is the most important thing when it comes to a peripheral, not because XX sensor, unless something technology-wise they come out that's completely different than anything else, always give it a shot. You know, look for reviews, just be like any sort of informed consumer, but chances are Cupper is going to be number one priority. I definitely agree. Uh, the only thing, and I have to point this out, because I, like, I know none of us covered it, and it's shame on us. We, we, we currently, Overwatch is a shooter. It is a hero-based shooter, but it is still fundamentally a shooter. You have to have surround sound, in my opinion. The difference yeah. between left, right, and front left, mid left, back left, upper left, lower left is huge. Any 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 headset that gives you seven sounds in each ear cup is huge because it gives you directional. It allows you to to compensate with another sense. So whereas your monitor limits your field of view, the earphones give you two more sets of eyes in different directions. So surround sound is the only thing, and it's the only thing I'll make a huge argument for in a shooter that you have to have. Play in StarCraft, you play in a game like that, I don't think it's as big of a deal, but in shooters specifically where omnidirectional hearing is huge, I think it's important. Yeah, this game is so hugely based on its sound cues when it comes to ultimates and things as well. But you can judge stuff so much faster. Like a lot of Reinhardt's wall, judge when that earth shatter is blockable either by its animation or its sound of the Reinhardt calling out 
what he's doing. Or for example, like you may not see the Genji pull his blade, but if you kill him quick enough, did his voice line get cut off at this certain point? Like, does he still have that blade? Stuff like that. So huge, huge uh, advantage if you have good sound and good surround sound. I definitely agree with that. I, I have a strong feeling I'm not going to get any argument from the surround sound, <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and move along. No, I hate more information. Prove that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody here who is the literally the information gluttons of their team doesn't want more information, yeah. Alright, so one thing that a lot of you probably generally have a good concept or understanding of that some of you may not have any understanding of. Literally, you came to this because it said esports coaching, maybe you play a different game. Uh, we're going to cover the topic of Overwatch right now, and in general, what type of game it is. I just I sort of said it a second ago. It is a hero-based shooter, so whereas in most basic shooters, you know, it's a point-click interface, I want to kill the other guy, I want to secure the objective, I want to move X into Y. This is, I now have cooldowns, so they borrowed from a MOBA perceptive, or a, uh, uh, god, I can't think, I'm good, RTS. And they gave you cooldowns and abilities. And you now have to micro those in with while playing a shooter. So that's the fundamental of Overwatch. And each hero is different. And you're only allowed to play one of each hero. Thank God. Uh, I hope everybody here endorses that. If not, we're going to bleep something right here. Because there's no reason for five divas and a Lucio. Um, but... Just uh, what's everybody's general opinion on like the basic of Overwatch? What is Overwatch to somebody who has never played Overwatch before? I feel like you covered it pretty well. It's definitely a shooter-based... Like for me, I, I consider it a shooter-based MOBA. That's what it is. There are cooldowns, there are comps, there are combos, there are things that you can do that require either CD or uh, build-up uh, of either way. And that, to me, has that little extra bit of processing that is needed from each player. And it has a lot more to do with teamwork than trying to, quote, unquote, solo carry. Because um, some of the other games that you can, that are, that are primarily shooters, um, say CSGO, for example, you can technically 1v5. That's because everything across the board is relatively even if you say both people, all the people have rifles, say they're all the same. However, in this game, everything isn't created equal. There's different damages, there's different characters, there are different everything. Like each hero can do a different thing based on the situation. So there's a lot more of that processing power that's needed. Um, I come from both backgrounds, so I enjoy it a lot, where a lot of players have come from just a straight shooter background. Um, so it's interesting to try to explain the fact of like CDs and cooldowns, combos, and all that for to some people that don't quite understand that it is both worlds. You can't just shoot people, or you can, but at a higher level, you can't just do that anymore. I think if you come from a mobile background, then you should be able to understand that Overwatch is much, much more faster paced than typical than, than, than your background. It is a very fast paced game. Um, like, if you ever watch a tournament game and you're not familiar with it, even if you are familiar with it, things happen so quickly all the time, it's hard to really figure out all that's going on based on, like, a first-person perspective, which is most of the time the tournaments are going on. There, Everything happens so quickly, and you really have to watch it sometimes several times to figure out exactly what happened. You, just, you can use sound cues to figure out a lot of it, but for the general, per, uh, general watcher, they're not going to be able to see that. So it's a lot more fast paced. Every single decision you make can turn from a great decision to a terrible decision based on a fraction of a second of when you used it. And that's the biggest difference between, in my opinion, like a MOBA and Overwatch, if you just think of it as a MOBA with FPS um, uh, features. And from the FPS standpoint, if you come from there, it's a teamwork perspective. Like you said, it's the fact that you can't carry solo. The fact that there's healing in this game that is very effective. The fact that there are health pools in this game that make the time to kill us a lot quicker, that you can't just kill someone in one headshot instantly, except for certain classes versus certain classes. And that is kind of the big difference in um, those two backgrounds with this particular game. And they kind of merged the two and made something honestly pretty damn unique um, compared to 
other games out there. Like people think, oh, it's TF2 clone. Well, not really. It's a lot faster pace, in my opinion. It's got the ultimates. It's got the uh, other things going on. Um, it's really, you can't really compare it to uh, any other game one-on-one -on -one, um, as it stands with, uh, you might make an exception with a certain certain game, which uh, you might have, say, bar each one borrowed from the other. I would say that Overwatch is, uh, it's as if a honest but simple daddy shooter had a baby with a unique but beautiful mommy MOBA and then was raised by their hero brawler uncle because it shares <laughs> aspects of both. But then the reason why I bring in the, the long lost uncle is because the game has such a requirement of teamwork that it's very reminiscent of uh, Heroes of the Storm which Blizzard self-stylized as a hero brawler, and that is you'll see moments of individual prowess, but the team that overall has the best teamwork will win 99% of the time. And that creates an interesting situation where you have teams who pound for pound might be weaker than other teams, but come through in the clutch with much better teamwork and just outperform uh, their opponents. Yeah. And Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just, just going to say, it's interesting because Blizzard can choose to, to build more into the mommy MOBA or daddy shooter aspect of it more over the next few years with the types of heroes and game modes they develop. Um, but I would even suggest that it's it's sort of basic in, in both right now. It's not very... It doesn't lean to the MOBA side that heavily. You have cooldowns, but that's it. There's no real map play like MOBAs have. And then on and the shooter aspect, there's certainly some very skill-based heroes, but that's a common complaint about a lot of pro players is that there aren't that many skill-based heroes that are super, super aim-focused. Yeah, I definitely think that Seamus' analogy is spot on. Um, one of the biggest things for Overwatch, and it's actually kind of funny when you look at it from the outside looking at it, is most games are 4v4-centric, uh, MOBAs 5v5, a lot of games like that. Sometimes you'll see 3v3. Uh, Overwatch took a different turn. It was 6v6. And it just, they said when they were developing, it felt better. And I definitely think that this allows for a lot more strategic depth from a coaching and analytical perspective. But I also feel like it sped up the game's pace a lot more because you added in more damage, more healing, more mitigation. But by increasing all three factors, you have this great triangle of what does what in the world. And Basically, Overwatch's balance is developed from that. So adding in the extra players and making the hero pools what they are basically developed the game into what it is. And I definitely feel as though, from my perspective, that if it was done in a different game style, I don't think it would have worked. And definitely Overwatch is unique for that. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, going into that, too, with the team play perspective, even with that little triangle, you know... Um, Say your tanks aren't doing a great job, you know that leaves your leaves your DPS and your your healers like open, you know, uh, leaves them perceptive to uh, not being able to get the job done as well. Uh, it's it's definitely a triangle in that perspective where if one part of that triangle isn't performing, it's going to break down on the other parts of that triangle. Um, so, like there, there's a there's a whole another world with the team play perspective where, like if certain parts of that team aren't performing well, you know, you, you kind of have to pick that apart and see where that's coming from. Like, that's, that's the way I view it, at least. Um, because there's so much HP there, there's so much damage there, there's so much healing to be found uh, just from those really, really tanky characters like a Ryan or a uh, or a Hog or something like that with a 600 HP health pool. Um, you're going to need those healers there, but you're also going to need those DPS to protect the healers and to help those tanks win. Like it, It's just, there's a ton of team play that goes into this game. Um, it's just, I don't think it's there in a lot of other games, uh, coming from a Call of Duty background even, you know, um, it's just, there's not a lot of team play in those kind of games, um, and the, there's just so much that can be taken advantage of, like, if you have a well-coordinated team, and that's just, comes to mind when, uh, when I think of Overwatch, at least, it's just all the teamwork that goes into it. All right, so that's actually a really good segue. We will go from there into our next topic, which is uh, Overwatch breaks down the hero pool, which are the people you can play, into four specific types, which is completely irrelevant to the pro scene because we'll use defensive heroes as the highest DPS if they're the best in slot, which is an ironic moment with Blizzard. But 
they have a, uh, uh, offense heroes, defense heroes, tanks, and healers. So we're, we we going to give everybody a shot at defining what makes each of those roles specifically good at what they do. And then we'll highlight how they are in the pro meta. Like I said, we generally try to use best in slot. But, like, I'll start off with, you may see a May that is a great defense hero. One of the best stall heroes in the game. May is really, really effective at it. But May is also has one of the best crowd controls in the game. So if there's something specific, a situation or something that's going to get to you, you're going to see she gets dipped into where she's no longer a defensive hero and she gets pulled into the offensive category. Or there's this really, really cool tech we do where we need the May wall. Something that is specific to that hero where we were talking about hero abilities that define each hero. And they get pulled in different directions, and we adapt them differently as coaches, analysts, players, however you want to do it in the pro scene. And you will see some wonky stuff we come up with, but generally there are the fundamental four hero types. Um, I'm just going to kind of like uh, spin a little bit on this in a different direction. Um, as coaches, you know, we, while they are split into four hero types, we don't see them as that at all, for the most part. Agreed. Like, uh, like Roadhog's not a tank. Does anyone here think a Roadhog is a tank? Uh, Hell no. Raise your hand if you're an idiot in the group. <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, well, let's just be honest. Let's like, there's there's not a single pro coach worth their salt who thinks that. Exactly. So I don't know Roadhog... about you guys, but when I play solo queue, my Roadhog sponges so much damage. Kind of feel like <laughs> I have so <laughs> much mitigation, man. <laughs> Roadhog is a 600 health DPS hero who can insta kill someone at three different ranges. And has six hundred, and can heal himself for three hundred health at a whim. It, that's what he is. He's not a tank. And um, we, when you pick him, we you pick him for the insta kill possibility, the pick potential with his hook or even his right click, his shield damage. You pick and you pick him for the possibly you know anti tank uh, capability as well. But kind of kills kills anything within his you know one shot range as well. So it's we don't see him as different roles, and like. You know, Symmetra, in our opinion, is nothing like the other support heroes. She's more like a Torbjorn than she is, you know, a Mercy. So, um, and Samba, you know, we don't take her for her damage. <laughs> and all the assault uh, characters, typically, you know, you're going to be taken, you know, for a particular role. So what we do is we see a character and we see, all right, what can she do? What's her purpose? What is her um, niche? And what is she, like, Tracer, okay, um, she's can feed on tanks, she's difficult to deal with, she can annoy him, she can uh, go off it unless if they have nothing on the comp to really deal with her. And it, it really opens up the back door to the enemy team composition to where they have to either play differently or ignore her and risk her doing way too much damage and have to find a certain balance to do so. Um, Widowmaker, do they have anything to contest it? Can we? Are they playing um, a very clumped up going further back? Um, lineups based on we know exactly how they're going to do this on first point or second point or whatever. Can we abuse that somehow? Widowmaker might be thrown in there because there's nothing they can do to counter it compositionally. And we we'll have to get free picks. Same thing with Hanzo. We don't we don't see him as like a particular role. We see him as like a tool, and we pull out that tool because that is something that's going to be able to get the job done in that particular instance. And sometimes we need to switch tools. Sometimes we don't. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we, we could spin on this a little bit longer because it's actually a really good thing for people to understand and discern. So before you go hating on the Hanzo main in solo queue, who will never swap because he's a one-trick Hanzo main, his hero fundamentally is designed for something. And one of the best things you can do, no matter what ELO and MMR you are at, I don't care if you rank one top 500, you better understand what his hero is supposed to do before you just blindly say, because you don't understand and you're being ignorant on the subject, just get off that hero, it's bad. Why is it bad? I'm not building my team composition around it. I'm not, you know, enabling him. One of the best things you can do if you have a Hanzo one trick is just play Zarya. Like, run something that's effectively helping him. Like, don't fight it as much as you need to understand it. If these genuinely you can provide fitting circumstances to why he needs to swap, 100%. I'm not going to say no. Like, there are points in times where one-tricking is terrible for you. But when you are the person, and this is coaching advice, yay, uh, you need to understand what it is you're trying to tell someone. Because if you don't, you don't understand it, why are you preaching about it? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think... Again, like I guess we, the Hanzo is probably like you say the best example. It's just like why again? Why would you scream and shout at him for swapping when 
you could just basically fall play into his hands, try and play around him. It's the same applies for a lot of heroes, I feel. Like, always try and figure out what is the best heroes to pair together. You know, there's a lot of comboing in this game. I think it's overlooked quite a bit, you know? Some people will try and just frag out and just try and get as many kills as they can on players are here, like Soldier or McCree, whatever. And they're just going to try their best to deal as much damage as possible. But sometimes just try and look a little bit further into the game and how the composition that you're currently running, the crazy, like, no matter how crazy it looks, like, what can you do to make it work? It, it, if you're attacking, or maybe just take that step out, have a little look, see what they're running. Wait for the enemy team's composition just to pop up, and then maybe just step back into the spawn and switch up instead of bashing your head against the wall for two minutes, feeding alts, etc. But um, yeah, I definitely agree. Like, if you have someone like the Hanzo main on your team and you need him to switch, then make sure you have the information to back up what you're about to say, because in theory you could you could help him and you could maybe win the game. Fair enough. He may be trash and he may miss every arrow he has, and you might have to carry even a little bit harder. But he may be a god, and picking that Zarya could win you the game. Yeah, um, going into that, actually. Um, the, in this game, you know, there's a lot of combo potential with a lot of different heroes, and there's also counter-picking. Um, now, early days of Overwatch, um, I don't know how many of you guys remember, like, the, the OG combo is what everyone calls it. You know, the Zarya Farah, you're getting blasted from above, and it's typically like a five or six man ult. Uh, developed into what the Big Bang, I think, Tracer Zarya combo. Oh no, no! Before that, it was the High Noon man. That was when yeah, we first yeah. discovered that High Noon was actually good. <laughs> what do you mean you could graviton in High Noon and all my Reinhardt has to yeah. discharge? <laughs> yeah. So then it was you know that uh, Tracer Zarya developed, then Diva Zarya developed. You know, the the bigger Bang. May Zarya. Yeah, that's uh Red we call that Black Red. Eyes. Yeah. That's my favorite. Yeah. So the there, black a... rhyme. What's up? The oh, yeah. black rhyme. Yeah. Super's favorite move. Yes. Um, but you know, there's a lot of combo potential uh, in the game, and there's a lot of counter picking. You know, like if they're running um, a heavy tank composition, Reaper used to be the play until he got, you know, nerfed into the ground. Yeah, nerfed into it's oblivion. Been yeah. Um, you know, it's now like you can run a Zenyatta and Discord them. You know. And that helps a lot. Um, May used to be good in the triple tank as well, you know. Um, Far doesn't do well with a ton of hit scans um, or a diva in her mouth. Unless she has a mercy seller tape to her ass. Yeah. Even, At that even point, you know. Still questionable. Yeah, but you know, there, there's there's just there's a ton of combo potential in the game, but there's also a ton of counter picking in the game it, that makes it truly unique in in and of itself, you know. Um, so I think that's like a, that's another facet of the game that people don't typically go into much or don't think about much when they're playing. Um, that that's a skill that actually has to be developed. But uh, if anything, if you guys have anything to add on to that, feel free to. I think you you covered it pretty pretty well. The only thing I will say is. And and this is something I hate to admit, because as a coach, it means I'm admitting defeat. As a player, you're just doing what's best, and there is something in Overwatch that is fundamentally due to balance issues and other things. It's There is counterpicking. There is a quote-unquote never-ending cycle of, I pick this, he picks this, so I pick this, so he picks this, so I pick this, so he picks this, you get it. But there is a point where that just falls apart and it cannot happen anymore. And it's called mirroring. And in the professional scene, mirroring is, is commonly accepted and everything. But I feel in competitive, just mirroring is you're not getting the most out of yourself. And you might be... Uh, I, I keep using this word, so I should probably define it. If, if you're a one-trick, you are a master of one hero. You, you, I, could, you could, I could ask you to play it any day of the week, seven days of Sunday, you know what to do. And then you expand your hero pool, and your hero pool basically shows how good and how broad your, your, your hero ability is. But if you are, say, the best player in the world, you can play everything. And you play against second best player in the world, you can play everything. And you two get into that counter picking. Eventually, because of the way the game is set up, and the balancing, and etc., and team compositions, team goals, phases, maps, there are tons of factors. But there's going to come a time where it's a mirror, where you can't counter the other person. 
and your combo and their combo are identical and team comps just turn into mirrors the reason is because we play best in slot and in comp queue it happens because you're most comfortable on it or you're playing with somebody who's playing something and the mirror happens and then it becomes the quote unquote and this is what pro players tell me all the time is the pure skill matchup when you're both level playing field everything's the same and basically i think that from my perspective I've, i have to admit defeat on that and it's really really hard for me to swallow when it turns into just a mirror but it is something that exists in the game and something that you you need to know when that happens so that you can understand that flexing into quote unquote the counter or flexing to something to deal with something else potentially is not the correct play but staying on what you are is yeah i think sometimes as well there is like that anomaly in there where there will be that like if i said to you what's the counters to widowmaker some people will be like genji winston stuff like that but there are widowmakers out there that will just destroy that winston regardless of the fact it's the you know it's the count it's the counter pick you know they will headshot you when you jump onto their high ground they will fall off the high ground you fall down with them they grapple back up and then they kill you you know that is gonna happen and there will be players that can outplay their counter but yeah i totally agree that with what you basically said yeah so fundamentally the hero types is something that's not set in stone if you're on offense I, I know this actually is a thing because i've been asked it before you don't have to have six offensive heroes you need good balance good team goal like your six heroes that you're using need to ha be going to achieve an objective and the objective changes based on what map you're playing so for those of you who think that four dps isn't meta and it can't make it work Maybe that's what you guys are good at. You need to take stock of it. You get a minute at the beginning of every competitive match, every quick play match. Talk to your people. Um, it's one of the big, big things you can do. And it's, it's a great segue into to what I'm going into. And I hope every coach here loves the segue. But communication is the absolute utmost important thing in this game. You can mechanically be yep. a B player. But if you can communicate at an A plus tier, you are far more valuable than a player with A tier fucking mechanics. But you cannot talk. Like, and I'm not talking a mute person, I'm talking about the emo kid in the corner who has daddy issues. So, if anybody wants to pick that one up, you can run with it. Oh, it got left on the table. We're cool with that. Uh, there is no other game, I would say, like Overwatch right now, in terms of the differential you notice from a player who has good communication versus one who does not. Because... Uh, and I haven't been involved in many, many esports or games, but but I do have some experience as far as team environment, coaching, and communication systems are concerned with a few. Um, and you have to recognize that Overwatch, in terms of its uniqueness and its and its strengths, like or at least what what defines a strong team in the game, communication is the utmost important thing. You can have an absolute shit tier comp and you can still win if you communicate it properly. You can have players who do not play individually up to part of their competitors, but that doesn't matter. It's a six to six game. If your unit of six plays better with each other and your unit of six communicates better and generally you see teams work better if their teams communicate better or their teammates do, then you will become a very, very strong team. And I think a good example of a team that Put a lot of time into communicating and working together when which was initially looked at as a team that was never going to be good at a professional level or at least high tier or even mid to high tiers kind of logic gaming and i would love to uh hear from you a little bit cuzzles because this is a team that initially had a lot of skepticism but i'm been really impressed with what you guys have done in terms of not only how you play around your guys as players but also in your teamwork because you guys have come from being sort of unknowns back when the team was announced at MLG um, Vegas towards being a team that's taking games against some of the better known teams in North America. Yeah, I think the short answer is a team house and grinding has helped a lot to the guys and just bonding in general and just being around each other and living by the CLG, um, not rules as such, but just like by living like that family kind of routine that CLG kind of uh, implies into their, their into their players, it just it just really helps. I think push um, staying tight and just constantly communicating everything because 
when I first initially started coaching these guys, I think, you know, the communication wasn't really there and it was the guys, they played around each other. Not the, All right. Like it was fine. It was okay. Um, again, on top, the guys mechanically and the things we were talking about earlier on, like posture and uh, peripherals and stuff, you know, they didn't have that, that kind of support as well. For example, like shiny was playing on a laptop, barely running overwatch at 60 fps 60 hertz you know with a tiny little mouse um and now he's on like a full decent setup so things like that helped but i think just that time to be given being given to bond to scrim together on a good a good solid routine um and then just kind of doing these like team building exercises and stuff we do and just basically given the chance to become like a family if that makes sense because that's one of the things we kind of live by it's just trying to stick together through everything through thick and thin and picking each other back up when we need to constantly just keep chatting to each other communicating and then it just kind of all sits it kind of comes all down to get come together i think really like a jigsaw piece um but it has taken a while and it's starting to pay off for our recent our recent results and things and we still have a long way to go but I definitely feel that we have some a lot of potential. And the same applies to a lot of the teams, I think, within just the scene in general. You can tell how and how the games evolved too and how the esports scene has evolved. Games have become faster, the you know, Rogue, for example, they're like an incredibly coordinated team. You know, their timings are incredible. Same applies to um Liquid. Like you guys have just become your timings, your you can tell your communication is amazing. And I think it's a small thing as well, but like for my team, target focus and things like it's so important. And these guys used to be absolutely fucking dreadful at it. They like never did it, and it was not consistent. And people never used to, you know, call their targets or get on the right targets. Everyone would be running on their one on ones, and next thing you know, they lost. Like, oh, why did we lose? It's like, okay, so we weren't focusing down on our targets, and then a long drawn out conversation would come from there, and explaining how the process of you know target calling comes about etc but yeah it's just loads of small things that just added up and again we have a lot more to improve on a lot of things to try and fix but um just grinding away at communication is definitely a key thing for any team regardless of how good you are mechanically uh you always need to be able to collectively as a team be in sync with each other and be able to communicate well I agree for 100%. It just came down to kind of what we were talking before. Um, you know, you could be just mechanically awesome, but it's so a game that's so team-based that you can't carry as one person. You have to have your team around you. That's just how it works in this game, just because, like you said, just how this game is made with the heroes in it, with the health pools, the healing, et cetera, et cetera. That's just how it works, and I thank you for the compliment. And I, I have to throw props back back at you because i remember i worked for carbon um for you the people that don't know carbon is a denver-based company that did uh the carbon in uh the winter series and then also did a tournament the ocs just recently and i remember seeing the one percent in there and i was sitting there i was like these guys have potential they're mechanically gifted and then they got announced to clg i'm like great but okay so where are they going to go from here and then they picked you up uh, as a coach and you guys got immensely better um and i will say right now even with guys that are that have been in the scene the competitive scene for a very long time now even they came from a game where communication wasn't really a thing like quake wasn't really a thing it was a 1v1 game so at this point it's like you know teaching them veterans in esports e communication was a huge leg up and it was something that i i learned from both league and cs those are very team-based games as well even though you can technically solo carry in those games um based on mechanical skill or just a little bit of help or whatever um there's still a lot of communication a lot of things that you have to just get out there to your team because it isn't just you playing it's you have four or five other people with you in the same server in the same map and you can't win as just one person it's almost impossible um so yeah i agree like communication is probably one of the most important things a coach can teach a team at all is just the communication and if there's you know differences in opinion fine but help people understand why that 
like communication piece or whatever is necessary. And communication doesn't even even just in game, out of game as well. If there's a problem with two players, get them to talk to each other. Yeah, this is creating that environment for discussion to be open, but then at the same time not to be like to be that right level of open. You know, not right. at each other's throats, like, giving each yeah. other criticism. Yeah, yeah. it's like exactly. really constructive criticism done in a way so the guys can basically learn from it but then at the same time not be extremely defensive and be like oh right. you said my tracer was bad blah 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 it's like <laughs> no i'm saying this i'm saying this it's like and then you're there as that kind of middle man i guess but then at the right. same time you're also that person that finds those problems and then delivers them you know yeah yeah <laughs> like you know you, you also do find those problems and you know you hand them out give right. players goals etc so and not to bash in a lot of esports because I, th I think a lot of them are really great guys. It's just a lot of them are, like we said before, they're a lot younger. They don't have the experience of actually dealing with a lot of people either. Um, they spend a lot of time perfecting their craft with their mechanics. But when it comes to talking, to interacting, to any of that other stuff they might not be quite there yet and so like developing that is also a challenge in and of, of itself because a lot of times people will bottle things up and they'll either play worse or they'll have resentment to a player and getting that out and teaching them hey it's okay to open up a little you know it's okay to talk to your team you're a team like you said because was like it's a family you guys spend all this time together either in person online and hopefully eventually together you know in a house or in a like a facility or something um that you know there's no resentment to each other there's you know you're able to like, openly express yourself without having to think that the other person is going to get hurt or other people in some cases yeah. Um, sorry. You have anything yeah, you, you, no, you go, precision guy. Okay. Well, I, I think I came from like the adverse side of this, to be honest with you. Um, coming into my team, like several people can attest to this. Jake is the most talkative dude I have ever met. I've worked with him. Um, but all these guys came from TF2, so the communication thing is like constant communication. They don't stop talking, but Jake and like Jake inhibits that. Um, you know, he he's really good at starting conversations that cause the team to think and I don't have to do it all the time because he knows when to do it as well. Um, so I, I think I kind of lucked into that to be honest with you. Um, but it, it's one of those things like if you even catch him playing ranked, he's micromanaging his ranked team. Um, and I think that's something that most players don't even do enough. Um, they, they just kind of take it casually but there's still like it, it helps them develop their communication skills. You know, you know? Um, it lets them try to micromanage what's going on, and our calling style is probably a little bit different from everyone else's, considering that my guys have a TF2 background. Um, but you know, like everyone has input say. There's not a set shot caller, per se. Um, there's not one person putting all that information out there for the team. Um, it's basically like everyone has input. Um, you know, this guy just used this cooldown, um, gives you that advantage. Uh, this guy's low HP, we should jump him. But there's always constant communication, constant information being fed to the team at that point. That is one thing that probably, uh, you know, we don't know about other teams is how their communication goes on. That's something that we usually don't have a peek into it. But um, I, you know, agree in the same way that you can't just have one person be your communication. You have to have everybody, every single person on your team be involved in communication some way or another because they're going to see things that your shot caller, designated shot caller, doesn't see. They don't know. And it comes back to, the, like, it's obvious by how much time we put into this particular topic that communication is massive in this game. And it goes back to team play. Like team play is such an important factor in this game and communication is so important to the team play. It's really that simple. And with the communication, it allows you to react without hesitation. And like I mentioned earlier, a, a play or a decision or an ability used at a second or a fraction of a second too late Think of any sort of uh, Reinhardt ultimate or any other, uh, you know, flashbang or any other situation like that. You can see the difference between a five-man kill and you just being completely denied and dead and you're, you're losing the team life. 
and you can eliminate that through proper channels of communication and not reacting as you're you know as you see things but know things behind, um, before then having a plan ahead of time knowing the right thing to do with and getting the right position positioning is absolutely critical in this game as well and it's not something that we've really had a chance to talk to as well and it's something that a lot of people don't really appreciate especially from a first person perspective that a lot of the uh tournaments go um so you don't really know what's going on um position wise how they're um setting up different plays how they're basically making the other team try to make a mistake and in this game for the most part whoever makes the least amount of mistakes and capitalizes on the mistakes of the other team wins and that's kind of goes to the team play and that's kind of what communication leads into and being able to set those sort of traps up or set those opportunities up to where you're comfortable and the enemy team is not comfortable is anyone else going to add <laughs> he went a bit silent there well Seamus had to, to go deal with something so uh i was going to give him a chance to do sell out for a moment but he's gone already so no sell out for him uh, that's actually a good breaking point for, for the first inaugural Coaches on the Couch podcast thingy. We're going to do some overtalk, just some general BSing around, um, and then we'll cut it. But I hope you guys generally just get the general concept of this is the absolute basics you come from. This is your grassroots, this is your basic thing, and you know a bunch of other stuff. So you want to just be able to do it and... Uh, be able to just take any information we give you. If you don't learn from it all, it's fine. If you pull tons of information from it and you're the next pro we're, we're coaching, we'd love to see it. Um, was really, really good. Uh, let's figure out some, some overtalk. So I actually had a question for all of you, and I'll start. Where did each of you start in Overwatch? What do you mean by start? Were you a player? Were you a coach? And who did you play for? And who did you coach? Where did you start in Overwatch? Uh, I guess since I'm, I'll, I'll start it. So I was, I mean, I started in closed beta, and me and some other people, we all have semi-professional to professional backgrounds and other shooters. I came from Call of Duty and Gears of War. Um, my friend came from Battlefield and Halo, and we wanted to become players. It was the new game and you know it was a dream of ours to become esports. <laughs> the, like that's just how it is. And you know, we started playing, but then we realized that hey, you know, like there are other people from other games, uh, uh, particularly from like TF2, Quake, that it just fits it better. It's not so much like a, you know, a Call of Duty, Halo kind of game. Um, but then I guess my first starting of like becoming a coach slash analyst would be Kara Clutch. I mentioned that a little bit before. And that was my first taste of doing uh, anything with a professional team in that point. Um, obviously, I was at other games. I've coached uh, collegiate and to, you know, challenger teams with league. I've done some with uh, invite teams to CS. Um, I've coached uh, some other Halo and some Gears of War teams, but those are very far in between. No one really knows who they are. Um, but that's pretty much my start. It was Colorado Clutch as an analyst, and then I went to coaching uh, some other two two teams after that whole debacle. Yeah, I, I pretty much have a similar background to Orth at that point. Um, did some organizational management um, and came into Cat5, which I worked with Orth for a little bit there, um, doing managerial stuff, um, and then made my way on to Bird Noises, you know, middle of December. Uh, before they got picked up on the hammers, uh, kind of developed coaching skills, which I had been doing traditional sports coaching on the side, um, particularly swimming, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I had developed coaching skills beforehand and kind of like, you know, applied them to the team um, because they had that lack of direction. Um, they, they needed a manager at the time, but they didn't really know they needed a coach. They, they you know, figured that they could do it themselves and kind of work my way into that role um, to help them. So uh, it's not as a traditional way of coming in and becoming a coach, but I had done managerial stuff and coaching beforehand, so it basically applied itself to the situation and made it valuable to my team. Um, 
I'm actually a little unique in the fact that before Overwatch and everything, I was actually uh, have some experience being a uh, baseball coach in some respects as well. So that's kind of, while it doesn't translate entirely into esports, there are a lot of things that um, you can get some similarities and you can get some uh, um, uh, things that have helped me along the way. But with Overwatch in particular, I started off as a player and uh, uh, participated in some of the Ghost Who tournaments. Um, I did really well, but the only problem was that I recognize that our team lacked um, a little bit of trust in everybody kind of understanding what was going on and what was going on wrong, what was going on right. And it's one of those things where in a team that's just starting out and if someone's saying, okay, this is what we're doing wrong and this is what we're doing wrong, you wonder, some of the players may wonder, okay, are they saying this in their best interest? What they think that the person saying this is actually one being, you know, making the mistakes or they don't agree with those situations. And they never really come to a consensus if you don't have that agreement with just six players trying to do their own little thing some of the times in some teams. And I kind of had um, like an epiphany at that point because I wanted to help teams figure out what was going wrong. I wanted to help teams try to pave the path for them so they don't, they don't have to worry about that thing. It's worry about focusing on what they need to do, getting better, improving. And that's why I kind of went the coaching route instead of the playing route. And I started off in a small organization, Arcadios. Um, probably never heard of them. They're an EU team. And uh, that's kind of how I started on the EU. I'm NA, uh, I live in Texas, but um, I started on the EU route um, just kind of uh, by chance and uh, wanting to go this route. And I really helped them uh, actually do pretty damn good in uh, some of the teams going out. They only lost two teams like uh, Creation and uh, um, Gravity Surge at the time, um, uh, you know, Reunited, teams like that. And uh, at the time with Arcadius, we had a couple of players who now are a part of uh, Singularity Gorillas, uh, the Helsinki Reds, and uh, they're, you know, pro players now. And I've actually keep in contact uh, with a lot of them and helped them uh, grow to an extent. But um, obviously, at one point, I got a uh, offer from Creation, um, who uh, was talking to uh, Numblock at the time, and I, you know, joined them and helped them uh, with their uh, um, uh, streak. I mean, we were doing very, very well in EU. I mean, we were um, top two or three. I remember back then, you guys were the team. <clears throat> that no one wanted to take the cough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that good. I remember that. It was a. Uh... Mm -hmm. It was yep. definitely something like people tried to uh, copy our composition, and it was just it didn't matter. Do it <laughs> we, we would do our composition better than you, so it was yep. like. Yep. Well, that was also before Hero Limit, so uh, our composition had to change a little bit once that happens. We were kind of running a double McCree setup that um, <laughs> we had two of the best McCrees, and that really helps with that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Um, uh, and uh, then, you know, we're from Creation, and we uh, got bought up by uh, Dignitas, and uh, I've been, you know, coaching them ever since. Yeah. Um, I guess mine, again, is kind of start off sports background-ish. Um, I've been a football slash soccer coach for a while. I've uh, taken a lot of taken a lot from that, and then Overwatch side. I guess I'm started off playing originally, like straight from beta. Um, uh, played on a couple of just like small teams, small pickup teams, like during the phases of when there was like, you know, there was no orcs signing anyone. There would be like the odd orc that got lucky and picked up like a mass group of like. Uh, there was one team that would get super lucky and get picked up by like one of the big orgs to start with, like you know, Envious was one of the first teams to pick up a decent team, etc. But yeah, I was uh, on, like just messing around in UK lands and stuff, and then moved into I think it was a small team called Encode, and then another UK team called Top Mid, like tiny little things, completely insignificant compared to the other guys. But I was still hovering around, and then I moved into the coaching side and coached Penta, like, like Dreamhack winter and stuff like that so that went really well and then really quickly i then saw the ad for clg and just went for that and it all kind of spiraled out of control from there i guess i was selected to go through the interview process etc and coach these guys for a little while while other coaches were also coaching them uh and then they decided that they wanted me and i guess yeah just went from there and I have taken a lot of my coaching philosophies from sports, like traditional sports, and I think it's helped a lot. 
um, alongside my knowledge of the game. So I have, you know, that hidden Wikipedia up there in my head. Uh, no idea how long I forgot that, but uh, my watch knowledge is pretty decent and, you know, my strat strategic mind and, yeah, and then my philosophies and stuff just came from f football, I guess, and just learning on how to keep a team together and making sure uh, everything sticks. So I think, I think you know, most of us have kind of all got that similar backstory, you know, when I'm, I'd say I'm not too bad as a player, but I've always had that preference towards coaching. You know, I kind of like making those strategies. I like being in that um, position as such. Some people might say, oh, you know, is it because you like to have control over the players? It's like, in theory, I guess you could say yes, like, but it's not that kind of power hungry control. It's more of setting them up from success and I enjoy watching them win and I enjoy knowing that I made that extra difference, you know. I enjoy that my strat just worked and the guys performed it well instead of more like, ha ha, I've got these six guys under my control. I can do what I want, you know. So I think you guys are probably on a similar boat. Yeah, I would say so. Like for me, when I was playing like semi-pro pro and Call of Duty and Gears, my mechanics were, they were good enough, right? But for me, and the, like for any game I play, I'm more of like the IGL. I like to come up with strats. I like to help my team utilize the best of what they have and use it effectively against what is coming at us. And that's kind of where, like you said, like I kind of switched from being a, like trying to become a player to just go, uh, to go into a coach because it just fits my wheelhouse just that much better. I like, I love seeing my, my guys doing really well and utilizing what I've taught them and just becoming better and growing as a team, as players, as whatever. And it's just like that, that satisfaction and that, that pride you get that you're the one that helped them get there. Like you're, you're polishing them. That's what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. Like origin stories wise, I think and this isn't me tuning my own horn, but I got probably one of the best to Overwatch. Like I, everybody wanted to be a player originally. I don't think that changes for anyone. Um, you might have come in and been a coach, but I mean, at some point you wanted to play something. You always wanted to be a player. That's why you loved the game. But for me personally, I was on a T4 team in the middle of nowhere. And we were just starting to get consistent, trying to make that transition to, to full-time grind, everybody putting in their effort and everything. And we did it for two, three months. And then uh, Weekly came up. Everybody remember the old Weekly tournaments? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. So we entered in the Weekly tournament. And we made it to day two. We were like, oh, my God, we're getting there. We're getting there. And I got seeded into Northern Gaming Red. Good old Northern Gaming Red with Chance, Mangachu, yeah. Northern Gaming Dude. Red. So we were like, okay, it's Northern Gaming Red. And I started doing prep work. I looked at a lot of their stuff that night. I started telling my guys, you know, this is what they're going to run here. This is probably what they're going to do here. Back when that was like a far-fetched idea, I took every bit of VOD I could find on them. And we went in and it was, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And then Mangachu's running around Molten Cord killing my team with a hammer. And that was the reality check for me that mechanically I can't do this. But what I had done into that was opened my eyes into where I was going to wind up going, being an analyst or a coach. So it was, you know, the eye opener. The team dissolved pretty much after that. But right after that, I went on. Um, some of you guys may have known I was on Sodi Pop as an analyst. Uh, they went to IMT. I had a short stint with IMT and then left. And then I hovered around for a little bit. And then I got with Kingdom. And then Kingdom got really popular. We had some of the dankest strats. And then we got picked up by Renegades. And this is where I am now. But the funniest part of this entire story is I can look to my player every single day and say, thank you. You ended my playing career and you started my coaching career. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. We went full circle. He, he, he's there. Now he's there. <laughs> so that's pretty much my origin story with how I got into this and where I went from. So... If anybody has any other questions they want to ask, we've got a little bit more time of overtalk if you want to do anything. What um, do you guys do outside of the game to keep yourselves from uh, deteriorating? As a, you know, that mind constantly ticking over. You know, as you play other games, you do other things, basically. You know, what's your way of chilling after coaching during the day? 
pretty much that. Um, I, you know, we, I'm sure all of us can agree. We spent a lot of time researching other teams, looking at the patch notes, coming up with meta, um, watching, you know, other regions, Korea uh, in particular right now um, is like the big reason that we're all kind of staring at. But outside of that, I don't like, I don't touch it because I feel like if I do, I will just get so burnt out. Like I still love the game. I will still play it. Um, I do play ranked every once in a while. I play the new events. You know, I support Blizzard because they gave us this great game. But there are times where I just want to go and play other game. I'm sure you guys know, like PUBG, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. All of us, I'm pretty sure, play it. Or at least most of us do. Um, yeah. That's a game that I just go in because like there isn't as much thinking, but like you can you still get the chance to frag out. You still get a chance to come up with strategies, with like tactics, with whatever, and so it keeps the mind active. But it's not just like you know out of there. You know, I play CS:GO as well. I play League. It's just kind of that little difference to make sure that you aren't burnt out every day. Because as a coach, you're you're watching it, you're not playing it, but then you're also dealing with your players as well in that game. So you don't want to get burnt out and that's another topic that i'm sure we'll talk about eventually is burnout um and i feel like it just if you immerse your game that much you do get burnt out like a lot of the korean players in starcraft 2 if you guys know that scene at all they get burnt out very fast because they're playing 12 plus hours a day they live breathe eat it and then all of a sudden they drop off the map because just they can't do it anymore you know yeah I think the simple question, a simple answer to that is, uh, you know, everyone who is here are probably gamers, and everyone who's on our teams are probably gamers as well. So, to although you try to avoid burnout in particular Overwatch, chances are when they want to get away or take a break, they play other games. <laughs> it's really yeah. that simple. Uh, play other games that are either a different play style or don't require as much um, uh, focus or as much uh, effort. In, so to speak, some do. And it depends on what they're comfortable with, but that's one thing. Um, also, uh, try to encourage at time to try to actually get out and walk around, get out of the house sometimes, um, especially if we're uh, doing some sort of land tournament, visiting some new place, or going to uh, some event or something. That usually helps break it up as well. Um, but yeah, people may not understand exactly how many hours per day, per week we actually put into coaching and put into esports. It is a lot. And it's I know over the, it's over full time hours. I it know. is <laughs> over full time hours. And we do it because Checks we love contract it. We it. suddenly realizes made a mistake. Yeah, like if we get play, made, paid per hour, we'll just say um, uh, probably hey, be yo, a... yo, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We, we might need to think about this. this yeah, I know, right? The greatest idea ever. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, continue. Yeah, and uh, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, I'm actually surprised that there have been other things that I've done in the past that um, I have burnt out much more quickly on. and But partly because, you know, I didn't enjoy it as much as I do. I really enjoy what I do, and it's it because of that. It's the burnout is not nearly there. I can do I can put in a lot more hours without approaching that level. So while some players can do that as well, other players, you know, it's not it's not just enjoyment. It's different from person per person. They can enjoy the hell out of it and still get burnout. You have to keep an eye on that. You have to keep breaks. Um, breaks between scrims are important. You have to listen to your players if they need something. Uh, if you don't want back to back scrims all the time, you got to have those breaks in there. Get that lunch in there. Get that you know, go on there and play some. Like you said, uh, uh, some battlegrounds in there. Um, you know, I even though uh, myself and some other players even play Hearthstone every once in a while. God forbid, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's actually a really chill game. That is something that kind of kind of wind you down a little bit, and uh, either before games or after games. And it's important to do that. Because um, especially like if you have a really grinding tournament where you're scrimming, you're really preparing, you're putting your all. And when it comes to tournament time, um, I can't. I'm sure other teams are similar, but um, with my team in particular, we take it up to another level. It's completely different. Yes, we want to try to scrim as tough as we can on tournaments, but there's no like substitute for the adrenaline you get for a tournament game. And after a long term, again, especially after what we just had in Pit, where we grinded against some of the best teams in EU over and over, sometimes three in the same day, it it takes a lot out of you. You've got to you've got to tame, tone it back a little bit because you can't keep that level up. You can't all the time. You can't get burned out. It's just like a it's like a boot camp in that regard. Instead, of, I think it's like you know an extra level or two above that. For me specifically, 
one of the big things I do, like, I worked as, like, I've been chasing the esports stream for 15 years. Like, I am ancient in esports. I am the old man. Um, I am beyond my prime. So, like, I have life experience. I worked security for 10 of those years almost. Um, so I was in the entertainment industry a lot. So I get to experience a lot of music. So that's one thing I'll do. Like, there are some days, like, you work 50, 60 hours a week. I just fall into a rabbit hole of YouTube music, man. Like, I look for the new underground stuff. I go back and I listen to stuff from 10, 12 years ago. I go down memory lane with some music. And it's just like, you know, it's that stereotypical dad thing. You know, he's got his, his music and his recliner. And he's just sitting there sipping on something while he's just listening to his music. And you're like, that's what I do. That's like my thing that's not Overwatch specifically outside of actually gaming. I guess if we're going down that route, for me, um, Precision, I don't know if you wanted to... Do you have something? Uh, I mean, I, I can input this, but you can go ahead. I'll input after. Okay, sounds good. Uh, for me, like, outside of the game, like, I... For me, my background when I was in college is health, health and exercise science. So it's a lot of working out and doing that. So outside of gaming, cooking and working out are my two kind of, like, quote-unquote releases. Like, I've had those since I was in college. I was working on, a, like, you know, med school stuff. I was working on, you know, working. Like, those are the things I go to of just, these. this is my time. I'm going to enjoy myself and do it. So outside of just gaming, that's what I do. Um, I just find it really therapeutic, and uh, I'm sure um, – some can agree and there's studies out there like exercising does do wonders for the mind itself and that's something i want to try to do with my team when we get kind of get together is making sure that they have a good healthy you know diet they have they are working out they're getting out of the house doing stuff that is active because that's something that is very you know important you know sound body sound mind is i'm sure everyone's heard that saying yep and uh perfect segue for me i'm glad i let you go ahead but you know uh like, I'm a big advocate for that because, um, you know, most people don't know, I have a, uh, I have a neuro background, uh, finishing up a degree in neuroscience. So, um, but uh, exercise, like a really big one. Not only does it like keep you mentally stimulated, you know, the endorphin release, all that stuff. Um, it helps with your performance, to be honest with you. Like, if you're leading a really crappy health style, uh, bad eating habits, you know, rarely working out, like uh, typical gamer lifestyle, you know, uh, it doesn't lead to longevity. It doesn't lead to top performance. Um, you know, it leads to short careers, injuries, as with any other sport, you know. Um, staying on top of your health, you know, um, working out, eating normally, you know, and putting plenty of water and fruits and stuff like that and having a well-balanced diet, it, it helps you stay on top of your game. Um, outside of that, you know, it's Probably music, uh, just like the old man here. Yeah. Or uh, I'm a I'm a pretty big movie buff. Uh, so typically, like you know, a couple of movies a week. If not, it's nerd session. You know, Harry Potter, like <laughs> movie marathon. Because I'm a dork, dude. It, it's what it boils dude, down you to. You just gave me the greatest idea, dude. Holy crap. I just thought about how good an Overwatch analyst would be as a dungeon master in freaking D&D. <laughs> that would be uh, pretty awesome. <laughs> Roll for critical. One, you missed the headshot. <laughs> oh, that would be hilarious. Sorry to cut you off. That was just really, really funny all of a sudden. <laughs> no, you're fine. So I have a question for you. How many times have you been marathon like, say, Star Wars or like Lord of the Rings or something? Oh, uh, but you don't want to know. <laughs> uh, that's why I'm asking. I want to know. Let's hear uh, it. Let's see here. Star Wars marathons. I've had at least five within the past two years. Holy Lord of the Rings, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I never really got into. We, we, so. we, have, we have another thing that needs to be settled here. Define marathoning Star Wars. Okay. Watching it in one go. Like I, literally, I, yeah. like, okay, one go. Straight, straight. Also, do you watch? Do you watch both trilogies? If you want to call it that. That's, that's yes, what, yes, that's what I'm do. getting at. Is is like yes. where are we going? Because we're up to eight now, aren't we? It's one through eight now. Because eight uh, comes out this fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's exactly. coming out. Uh, I would say one through six at least five times. I, I can make it through it. It's not that bad. Do you watch it in order, like one through six, or do you go yeah. four, do you four watch six, six okay. and then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's the really weird thing, because some of these like intertwine with each other. Now, typically, I can do, you know, the, the, the one through six, you know, chronological, quote-unquote, order. But go, like, 
I'm not even kidding. Go Google like the technical order for like the Star Wars movies that some of these like kind of work together. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head. I have it written down with my movie list uh, if I want to do it that way. But there, there's like another way you can watch them that they even like they make more sense together per se. Um, they make it like a really good movie marathon session. Definitely for me, Lord of the Rings is a must once a year. Like I, I, I never got books, into it, man. Read the books. I've done and that. The movies. <sighs> Like hold on, hold on, hold on. There's here's here's personal sellout moment. All right, so my mom and dad were were nerds, and I can claim nerd lineage here. All right, my name is you know as a gamer, it is Morgan Curgeon Pasillas. My actual middle name, given by birth, is Dane. I am high king under the mountain. I am named after a freaking <laughs> dwarf. <laughs> I'm Dane sure? Ironfoot. Are you sure? Yeah. Rocking that dwarven heritage, dude. I got the beard too, man. Oh, uh, here we go. What? You got a problem with facial hair? No, we're gonna need to see that. That's what I wanna know. Let's go. I thought y'all had me on uh, Twitter. Everybody follows me on Twitter. Doesn't look at my picture. Next line, you have to come dressed as like in full <laughs> Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. <laughs> I've already made a promise to my dudes, and and I'll reaffirm it for the podcast. And this is hundred percent serious. Um, if we ever make it to a big enough land and I can get the stuff together for it, I'm going to dress up as a renegade. I'm going to dress up as our little little uh, dude. I'm going to come with a bandana, because I wear bandanas from my long hair anyway. I'll get a cowboy hat, team colors, trench coat, you know, holsters. I'll come as a renegade. I told my dudes. And that was one of their motivations. So that's the biggest thing about us getting to a major land, is that's my promise to them. And if I can swing it, I'll make it happen. So that's another reason for the beard. Sounds like a good idea. I want to see that. And the thing is, I doubt, I don't doubt that you guys will get in or not qualify. So you guys should be fine. And uh, yeah, we'll be seeing that. Hopefully, hold you. I will hold you that. Hold you to that. Though. It's fine. It's fine. We can hold you to it. I, I mean, there's also Al coming up too. So you know. Yeah. Eventually, eventually, <laughs> huge quotation. We'll get you there. Down. Hold on. Soon, I think Kurgan's going to lose his job as coach uh, as coach now and just become mascot and just mascot. be there at every game. <laughs> the ultimate demotion. <laughs> Could you imagine that though? Every week I have to dress up like a cowboy. I walk out with spurs. And I, I can imagine some worse thing. ones. I can imagine some worse like mascots you'd have to dress up as Rockets? for certain orgs. <sighs> I don't know what else have we got. Let's think. Let's, think. Like, let's, let's honestly think. Selfless. Also, like... Selfless is a lion. Um, yeah, liquid's a freaking Pegasus. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We actually have to ask, Precision, what is um, LG Evil? That, it's literally an eyeball, dude. <laughs> <laughs> just, just go look at it. It's an eyeball. Just no, look no, at I, it. I, I didn't know if it was supposed to be a monster. We couldn't see the rest of it. Like, I, I get it, but... Okay. I just wanted to I'll give sure. you Rob's rendition very shortly. Just give me a second here. This is Rob's rendition of our, uh, of our emblem. Okay. I gotta find well, the while file. He's doing that. He's looking, and uh, I'll see if I can snip that into. There the video you go. Version. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, there are some other teams that have uh, special ones. Like I think, I think being the TSM mascot would be the easiest, though. You just gotta be a pretty boy and wear stuff that you wore like in high school: the letter cool. jacket, jeans, and tennis shoes. <laughs> It's probably really bad. I don't know what CLGs would be. I got nothing for you guys. I got <laughs> no be honest. I, at one point in my life, I was a huge CLG fan, and now that I think about it, it's like, all I can think... Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. And this is 100% would be hilarious. Whoever I think you just dress up as Hotshot. No, you gotta dress <laughs> up as freaking St. Vicious. <laughs> Way hmm. back when. Oh, Jesus. But, yeah, that would be pretty good. But, I definitely, I'm actually thinking now, holy crap. It's the same goes for, like, Envious and Complexity and Fnatic. Like, what the hell do you dress up as, you know? But we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see. I, actually, what we'll see. Goes. I, I have a good one for Envy, but I can't say it on this because that's slander, so I won't say it. How um, much you want to bet the people that don't have anything they can quote-unquote dress up as, they just hire like, a very pretty girl, and just, like, that's them. Or, I mean, they, they could take the baseball route. Like, have you seen some of these baseball mascots that have literally, like, nothing to go on? Yes. With their team? <laughs> it's it's just like absolutely insane. Yeah. yeah, dude. 
Like the Colorado Rockies literally have. Hold on, Barney hold on, hold on. I actually said it's, it's a dinosaur. <laughs> oh, I guess yeah. Like Arsenal, the football team in the UK, the the called the Gunners, and their logo is a gun, but their mascot is a dinosaur. And you get the police in there. I don't know what that was gu- supposed to be. Gunners, like, yeah. <laughs> could could anything your like, mascot yeah. just be a pair of thighs? NRGs. No, envy. <laughs> oh, oh, if we're envy, I was supposed to say we're NRG. Or- I was, man, I feel bad. I made reference to the Taimu thing and nobody got it. Feels bad, no. man. I'm not down with the uh, NV memes. There's a lot of memes uh, circling around at the moment, though, so I have to keep up. Very, very I, popular. I, those. I don't. I. I just not can't can't be bothered. All right. Well, I have a feeling this is a good wrap up point, so we're gonna start at the top. And we will give everybody a chance to do their pitch, sell out, however they want to do it. You're more than welcome to do anything. We are equal opportunity here um, until a sponsor says otherwise. Uh, you're more than welcome to sell out everybody. We'll do it equal opportunity everything. So nobody's left behind. If you got somebody here repping you, we'll be more than happy to accept everything. So go ahead and start us off. Um, yeah, I guess if you want to catch me on Twitter... Uh, COG Cuddles. Um, I am Henry underscore at Henry underscore Cuddles. If you want to catch me on Instagram, I think it's Henry Coxel. Maybe I will just quickly check that. Maybe completely wrong. And then on Twitch, it's Coach Cuddles. Uh, I don't stream too often, but when I do, it's uh, usually a lot of laughs and just super chill. So yeah, just come over and check it out. But main thing is Twitter. That's where I like to vocalize most of the things I'm getting down and doing. All right. Um, uh, my Twitter is uh, at Overwatch Tactic. Um, uh, and main thing is, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see, and it's not more of just a personal sound, but just kind of a shout out to uh, tournament organizers. I'd like to see more EU versus NA tournament, Lance. <laughs> I want to see more of that. Atlantic Showdown was fucking fantastic. And I think everyone enjoyed it. And I'd like to see more things like that. And, uh, you know, Personally, I think that'd be pretty interesting to see how the results turn out. All right, I guess it's me. Uh, Twitter is uh, at PrecisionOW, um, where I'm going to voice most of my opinions on things going on in the current scene. Uh, I will occasionally stream, so that is uh, twitch.tv forward slash PrecisionOW. Um, Pretty random, but you'll probably find me and Oris playing PUBG or doing something stupid. Yep. In our off time. Um, and other than that, you know, if you want to keep up with the organizations or anything like that, uh, at Luminosity. For me, uh, well, Twitter is at Liquid Oris. Uh, if you guys uh, spell that, it's A U R I C E. I actually, for some reason, it just doesn't click. That's fine. It's like my last name. It's Win, um, spelled N G U Y E N. So. <laughs> I can kind of understand, but um, I also have uh, Instagram trying to figure out what it is. I think it's, I don't use it that often. For me, I have it in a place is just kind of, if I go on vacation, if I see something cool, um, if I cook something really cool uh, for me, because I cook a lot, so I'll make a dish that just usually doesn't get cooked and I'll post it. Um, just a little sell up there for me. Uh, for my Twitch, it's at uh, it's twitch.tv slash Oris2, the number two at the very end, because there's people that take that name apparently before me, and they don't use it, which is really odd. But um, for me, I like I really want to see just the owl. I want to know what their plan is, what's going on. I want to get this going because I think it's going to be a great place if they do it correctly. Um, and like you said, uh, Shifty, kind of like the NAEU tournaments kind of like that like i want that to be kind of one of the places that we do do that Mm -hmm. um everyone's kind of playing and have a constant global like ranking almost you know like what everyone is doing we get to see every week or every other week it's something kind of cool so i think everybody wants that to be honest all right so our friend who joined halfway through and then left the game early uh was seamus seamus anderson most of his stuff i believe is at seamus one uh you can follow him i believe on twitter uh i believe that's also his twitch tag if not you can go to his twitter bombard him with messages find out who the hell he is if you love him that much um i know he probably had one or two other sellouts but i don't know what they are because i'm not omnipresent so that was seamus anderson uh definitely good guy 
Um, for me, I am at Empacillus or Curgeon. You can follow me on Twitter. Don't use any other social media. Sorry, I'm not that guy. I'm old. Uh, I have Twitch. You can follow me at Curgeon. Um, we're going to start putting these episodes out. Uh, generally, we'll try for once a week, but we're all coaches. So if the tournaments get really hyped and heavy, you're not going to see us. And if there are a few of us who decide to put it on, uh, you'll see different faces during the weeks. So potentially this show should get a lot more depth than a bunch of other stuff. Um, biggest sellout for me is everybody who came on. Thank you very much. Can't do this alone. I can sit here and rant and rave in my chair all alone. But having other coaches here, other people who understand the same content, have the same thought process is generally a huge help. And it gives us another like voice on the side. So I can't thank you guys enough. Again, the five of you who showed up. Um... And I think that's a good wrap-up point for this first one. It's a little longer than we'd like for our general showtime. We may get a few that are longer, may get a few that are shorter. But I definitely hope you guys liked it. Um, we'll post some stuff on Reddit. Give us feedback. Let us know. Love you guys. Oi. Thank you.